Well, our time is marching on here. Time to start, too. Well, welcome, everyone, to the virtual church. I'm your host, Kenneth Westby, and we're originating this program in Renton, Washington, which is between Seattle and Tacoma, here in the great Pacific Northwest. It's a beautiful uh, fall day, nice frost on the ground, sun outside, uh, chilly, uh, but uh, it's the Thanksgiving kind of weather we look forward to and anticipate every year. Well, I hope it's going to be a happy Thanksgiving for you and your family. Uh, my wife and I are planning to travel to Spokane to be with our uh, children. In fact, they're all going to Spokane. Our youngest daughter lives there, and she's hosting Thanksgiving this year. And so we'll be going there to visit uh, with with her and her children, and then our two sons are driving over, and our oldest daughter's driving over, and we're driving over, so... Uh, it's over the mountains and through the vales and over to Grandma's house, except in this case, Grandma's going to grandchildren's uh, house and, and daughter's house. So we'll have all four of our children and their mates and ten grandchildren. So it'll be a wonderful time. Looking forward to that uh, turkey and uh, gravy and mashed potatoes and cranberry sauce. Those are my favorites every year. I'm not big on the stuffing business. Uh, my wife likes the stuffing. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with the, um, the mashed potatoes and the gravy. That's kind of my favorite. So I hope we don't indulge, overindulge too much. Uh, we'll try not to. But it's a happy time. I hope it's going to be a family affair for you. I hope you have somebody to share it with. As a time to give thanksgiving, as um, a remembrance of the earliest thanksgiving when our pilgrim uh, fathers came out over here and uh, had their first uh, year and, of course, offered thanks uh, to God. And it is a thanksgiving uh, to God for, for life, for food, for blessings. And we've got so much to be thankful for in this abundant free land. Uh, that we still enjoy. Well, before we begin today, we're going to ask the blessing of uh, the Mighty One, and will you join me as we pray? Father, our loving God, we ask your blessing now as we study your word. Help it to pierce into our minds and our consciousness to motivate us to action, the action being to become like you in love and kindness and justice, righteousness, and all the good things that just emanate from your good and sterling and beautiful character. Help us, Father, in that pursuit. We know that's your aim for us. We know that is how your Son became just like you. Help us in that same process. We ask your blessing now on everyone who's tuned in today. Those of us who might be of heavy heart, lift the hearts. Give us the hope, the grand hope, the clear hope of your future kingdom soon to come to this earth. And give us strength to endure to that time. We ask your blessing on everyone today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Well, those of you uh, watching on camera may uh, be aware of my uh, big bandage on my left ear here. I uh, apologize for the um, unsightliness of it all. But uh, my wife said uh, when I, I came uh, back from having this uh, surgery done on the ear, she said, you look like a pugilist who's just come from a fight with his cauliflower ear all bandaged up. And that's about what it looks like. It was just one of these minor surgeries. I guess no surgery is minor, but uh, it seemed to be. Uh, cutting off some of the um, overexposure to the sun. Um, you know, the left ear is the one out the window of the car and over the ears. Fair-skinned people particularly. Um, 
get too much sun, too many sunburns, and later in life, uh, sometime along the way, these little cancers grow in the skin, and they have to be uh, cut out. So I had to go through that, so I'll have this Omni for them. Oh, maybe a couple of weeks or something like that, so it's a little inconvenient, but uh, survivable. Apologize for the odd look of it all. Well, the topic uh, today, I have two topics, often I do, uh, and the first one here is on too many books, too little wisdom. It's a study, a brief study, and just a couple of passages in one of my favorite books, the book of Ecclesiastes. So turn there, uh, would you please, and we'll just read a couple of verses right at the end of the book. It only has 12 chapters, and... We're going to start right toward the end. Uh, the subhead is called the conclusion of the matter. So with all of his pondering and uh, thinking and meditating, cogitating, ruminating, and analyzing, uh, the teacher here, the preacher, Koleth, uh, I guess is the Hebrew name for him, uh, has conclusions. And some people just like to read and study and read and study and uh, never come to any conclusions. They don't seem to really want answers. But this wise man, that's why it's one of the wisdom books, uh, wants to come to conclusions. After analyzing life, work, uh, the vaporness of life, how it's so transitory, how it comes and goes and withers, just like, uh, as he calls it, vanity, a breath. Uh, what's the purpose of it all? And he saw various purposes throughout the book. It, it's good to live with the wife of your youth. It's good to work and draw pleasure from your work. And uh, he analyzed various aspects of life and also the vanities of life. And But he didn't leave it blank at the end you know some people like to have kind of an agnostic view about everything say everything so oh it's a question i don't know i don't know we can't know so they like to study and then come to the end well we can't know and that seems to be their door that they can go out they don't have to act on any of this study they do they can just say well you know it's really interesting and and all that but you know we really can't know anything well that's not wisdom Wisdom is to find answers to things, particularly to the big questions of uh, of life. Well, let's just read the conclusion. This is Ecclesiastes, uh, Joanne, chapter 12. I, t I told him this was surgery, Joanne, here. It wasn't you boxing my ears. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are suspicious that you might be beating me up, and I should be looking for uh, one of these uh, male recovery places here for battered husbands or something like that but uh, uh, Joanna's the opposite of that she's my loving care giver puts up with all my aches and pains and moans and groans and all Ecclesiastes 12 verse 9 not only was the teacher wise but he imparted knowledge to the people he pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs sifted through things uh, set in order found the purpose those that weighed the most sifted out the best the teacher searched to find just the right words and what he wrote was upright and true so here's the wisdom congealed down from this wise man in Ecclesiastes. The word of the wise, the words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails. Now what in the world's that? Uh, like firmly embedded nails and goads? Well, you may know the little of the background we're dealing here with an agricultural world and people using uh, oxen and 
animals to uh, plow the fields. And a lot of times these oxen and animals didn't want to plow. And so they had uh, one thing that, that a lot of them used. These goads were like a, um, a board uh, with uh, nails which were embedded with their points exposed. So if the uh, animals did not want to go forward and plow and they wanted to kick back at you and the plow, they would kick against those nails. And that would be, ouch! And they would stop kicking and start moving forward and do their job. That was one of the ideas. Uh, a goad could also have been and apparently was sometimes used as a board in which nails uh, or a nail was exposed or like a, uh, uh, a, a spear uh, or a shaft with a spike at the end to prod the animal along, to goad them along. <laughs> and that's where the, the word comes from. Uh, so what is he saying here? He said, well, the words of the wise are like goads. In other words, they'll keep us on the right path. Uh, they'll correct us. And if we kick against wisdom, if we kick against the commandments of God, you know what, you know what happens? It hurts. It really hurts. It, it can bleed. There's a lot of Proverbs about committing adultery, and it talks about uh, it's like having a fire next to your chest. You can't bring a fire next to your chest without getting burned. So is a man who commits adultery. It's going to get burned, and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt a lot of people, not just himself. And, of course, it hurts his relationship with God, even if nobody ever finds out about it. He knows, and God knows. So, yeah, we, uh, we sometimes need to be corrected, and words of wisdom in Scripture uh, do lead us. They show us the path. They correct us. Uh, they correct uh, against our disobedience and encourage us in the right path. Is that bad or is that good? The words of the wise lead. A Torah is considered the instruction. It doesn't mean just laws like a stack of rules. It's instruction, patient instruction, in the context of a father giving to his children, his sons and daughters, of the way they should go. Uh, it's the good way. The way that's going to lead to happiness, it's going to keep you on the path, it's going to keep you out of that ditch to the right, the ditch to the left. Uh, it's going to keep you from going off the bridge uh, into the deep and drowning. It is the way uh, that's going to get you where you want to go, ultimately. So, yeah, those, these are wise words. So Scripture does uh, uh, correct us. So if nails and spikes can remind a dumb animal... Uh, what not to do and which way to go how much more the words of God um, as we study them well continuing here uh, their collective sayings are um, like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd now what shepherd would that be mind you well a lot of versions have this capitalized and probably rightly so Remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, the one shepherd, and often God, Yahweh, is likened to a shepherd over Israel. And that is one of the terms uh, uh, that we can use to describe his relationship uh, with us as a shepherd. A shepherd protects, a shepherd leads, leads us behind, uh, beside still waters, green pastures, and so on. Uh, that that's Torah, that's the right way, that's the way of wisdom that he wants to lead us. But these these are words given by one shepherd. Who is the giver of wisdom? Well, when we read the book of Proverbs, it says, well, wisdom comes from God. And uh, if you want to have wisdom, it begins with the, the fear of God. As we've discussed previously, that there's nothing more than the the great Shema, the first commandment, loving God with all your soul, strength, mind, being, intents, purposes, 
everything. Uh, loving God, seeking God, is where wisdom comes from. And this whole process of study here, of the words of wisdom, uh, are what bring you to that point. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. So he is saying that these words of wisdom, carefully sifted, separate, uh, separated out, above, standing above all the other proverbs, uh, are, are to be revered. And he says, Be careful, my son, of anything in addition to them. In other words, uh, don't, don't supplant them with some other philosophy, some other knowledge. Well, there's a lot of things to read out there. Uh, but uh, how about getting answers to really what the big questions are? I read a lot of uh, books. I I like magazines. Uh, I've been criticized by for having too many books and magazines, and uh, the criticism is probably valid. Um, but today, you know, we've got so many books. This was he says next, of making many books. There is no end of much and much study wearies the body well what could he be referring uh, to there well today if there were too many sources of knowledge and books then uh, to study and get weary over how about today that I mean the printing press wasn't even invented back then now was it today we've got books by the by the millions millions it seems like everybody and his brother's writing a book about something and we got magazines for every little niche interest you can possibly imagine. Every little trade, every little hobby, every little uh, perversion, every little uh, interest, uh, and as well as functional magazines having to do with business, construction, uh, aeronautics, uh, chemistry, y you name it. There's a magazine uh, for it. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge out there and there are blogs 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 everywhere good blogs a lot of them articles without end uh, you say well it's too much you can't read it all of course you can't you can't read it all and uh, not all uh, sources are are equal not all knowledge just because it's in print is, is, is not equal we have to be selective like he was doing here he said uh, he searched out he pondered and said in order many proverbs. He found out what was the best. Best for what? Well, in answering really the big questions of life where he comes down to his conclusion here. Uh, what are the big questions? Well, it's who is God? Is there, is there a bigger question? Tell it to me, please. Uh, who am I? Is that not important? Are you a result of aimless, accidental uh, evolution? Or is there a purpose to your life? Were you made with a purpose? Do you have a designer? Do you have a intended function? Uh, who am I? And how then shall I live? If there is a God, if he made me, and I have a purpose, then how shall I, I live? That's where it comes down to the action. Because we do live, don't we? 24 hours a day for so many years. How do we live? How do we live to get the most happiness and to move toward that purpose, fulfilling that divine purpose, wherein is the real deep satisfaction of fulfillment in life, not just now, but eternally? So these are the apex questions. Again, if you know a set of uh, higher questions, uh, I'm ignorant of it. Let me know what what they might be but these are the questions not even in, not even discussed in 95 or more percent of all that's available to be read today right they just don't discuss it now that doesn't mean that all this knowledge in these books and magazines are worthless of course not uh, there's, there's worth in them uh, particularly in your field or your study or your hobby or or your interest, uh, you know, we, we take different things. I, I take popular mechanics. I like to read in popular mechanics. I take popular science. I like reading that. Um, I take uh, history magazines. 
uh, archaeology magazines, political magazines, uh, travel. Uh, I like to study about animals, uh, various aspects of science. I mean, there's no end of things to learn. And uh, learn about God's creation as well. And you kind of give God uh, glory uh, for that. So isn't it exciting to learn? Yes, it is. It, it, it's all it's all good. Um, but the the area where you get the answers to the life questions, the life giving questions, are centered in the revelation of God. One source of divine truth, of divine wisdom, uh, for God and man, and that source above all else, and you have to ponder it and come to that conclusion yourself, is, uh, is Scripture. Now, Scripture has uh, some other supplemental revelation, of course. What would that supplemental revelation be besides studying Scripture? Well, things like creation itself. These are the handiworks of God. You know what he's done with his hands? Learn a lot about an artist by his art, <laughs> can't you? You can learn a lot about God by what he's made and what he's done. It's big, it's glorious, it's fantastic, it's incredibly detailed and complex and powerful and every kind of superlative adjective you want to add to it. It's mysterious, too. It's beautiful. So, yeah, we have that revelation. Uh, but if, if it's in a context of, of God, well, then it, it has an added meaning because we know a divine intelligence made it. So that's an insight into the mind of God. So that's a form of revelation. And also human experience can be a form of revelation too. This is what Ecclesiastes is all about. His experience, analyzing life, analyzing people, which what happens to people when they go this direction, that direction, when he weighs things, what weighs something, what doesn't. What's stupid and vanity? Uh, what's eternal and has some lasting quality to it? He weighs all that. It's like we do in life. We try to find out, well, what makes a good person? Why do I like some people? What gives me really deep satisfaction rather than temporary um, happiness or slaking some lust or appetite? Well, we, we learn by experience, don't we? And uh, when we do something wrong, you know, you touch the hot stove, you burn your hand, you realize uh, that's a bad thing to do. And so it is with sin. Sin produces tears, tears of unhappiness, not tears of joy. Have you experienced that? Well, that's a revelation. It should be combined with uh, the revelation of Scripture, which gives the actual origin of man and it's about God and man. That's what the whole Bible's about, about God and man. And God's plan for man starts right from the beginning with God, then introduces man. It says something profound in verse 26 of the first chapter, that God intends his purpose, his ultimate purpose, is to make man in his image. Now that is truly profound. So there's one source of divine truth, and that's the uh, Scripture. And uh, Ecclesiastes here, uh, the wise man says, uh, Be careful, my son, um, to not uh, add anything to them. In other words, don't supplant that with some other kind of knowledge. And many books, verse uh, uh, 12, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Now, you don't find too many people that spend too much time studying the Bible. Well, let's be confessional about this. Maybe some do. But that's not a problem with most people. Uh, maybe it is with you. Is, is it your problem? You spend too much time studying the Bible? You can tell me. <laughs> I won't tell anybody else. Well, it's probably not a problem, is it? Uh, my problem is I don't study it enough. I like to study it more. Uh, but just studying it. Now, now, some people just study, study, study. People write commentaries. You know, I've been reading a commentary here, a nice one, 
on the book of uh, Colossians. Well, here, I'll hold it up for you. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful commentary. Now, Colossians is only about, what, three, four pages in your Bible. But this uh, commentary uh, is um, 549 pages. <laughs> so uh, how can you write so much about it? Well, actually you can. And there are things to be learned, you know, background and all kind of ancillary knowledge on this and that and the other thing. And it's heavy reading, of course. Uh, so some people just devote themselves to study, 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 study. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times it's just ask questions. People study and they ask questions, study and ask questions. Uh, do they really want answers? Well, that seems to be kind of what the writer here of Ecclesiastes is, is getting at. Uh, the warning about studying seems to be a caution against those who just study and live to ask questions without actually seeking answers. Do you know that? Do you know what I'm talking about here? About wanting to study, study, and may have asked questions about this. I got a lot of questions about I'm a cynic. I got questions about this. Questions about, well, what about this? What about this? But at the end, they walk away with not really wanting any answers because they, they have a little philosophy. It says, well, there aren't really any answers. So that's convenient for me. I don't have to make a decision. I don't have to be judged by expected actions because uh, who knows what the actions should be. It's a cop-out. It's a mental laziness. It's a self-deceit. No, the whole purpose of study and learning is to get answers. Uh, it isn't, you know, a true scientist. He studies things and facts and figures and data and everything else to find answers to questions. Sure, the questions are always going to pop up, but you want answers uh, to the questions here. So, now this is, this, uh, is what he's going to summarize, verse 13. Now, all has been heard. Now, we've gone through this, he says, in this book. It's a book you can read anytime you want. It's one of these you can pick up and almost read any part in it as a standalone, but it sure helps to read from beginning uh, to end. Now, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. So, for all of us writing and posturing and speculating and pondering and everything else and asking questions, he asked questions. He was seeking a conclusion. This is what a lot of us don't want to come to. We don't want to come to a conclusion. How does this affect me? How should I live? Is there really a God? And if so, and I made it as image, what's that mean for me? Here's the conclusion. In other words, there are answers to the questions. And here's how he summarizes it. If you had any question who that shepherd was, so this ought to answer it. Fear God and keep his commandments. These words of wisdom, <laughs> this path. For this is the whole duty or purpose of man. So how do you get the purpose of man out of fearing God and keeping his commandments? Well, his commandments come from the very character of God. Fearing God, as we've said, is, is this reverence of God. It isn't trembling and shaking. He's going to hit me with a lightning out of a cloud, a black cloud. No, it's, it's fearing or revering, revering, committing to God is what it means. Your whole being, everything. And then comes the wisdom of God, how to live. And does it just come in one dose? Or do you have to do like this guy did here? Ponder and search the knowledge. Yeah, that's how it is. Study. Uh, put some effort uh, into it. And here's what he concluded. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole purpose of man for God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing whether good 
or evil. Yeah, there is no sliding under the door. There's no uh, great eraser. Uh, God sees and knows all. So you're not fooling anybody but yourself. If you say, well, I can't know, or I'm just studying, or I just got a lot of questions, I don't, I don't have any answers. Anybody who thinks he's got an answer is, is, uh, is a hypocrite. You know, I've heard that said. So in other words, I'm a little better than most people because I declare there are no answers. And the people who think there are answers, they're the simpletons. But I'm the smart one because I believe there are no answers. Ha ha. You see that arrogance among the, a lot of the elitist escapists? Uh, that's narcissistic thinking. In other words, you are the answer is what you're saying. And you've got the answer for yourself. And you don't want any other answers intruding onto the one you've conjured uh, for yourself, uh, utter deceit. Well, we study, we search, we ponder for the purpose of concluding something, of getting an answer. And then when we get that answer, that wise answer, what do we do? We act on it. Like he said, we keep his commandments and fear God. Jesus said, that's the greatest commandment. <clears throat> well, uh, next week, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's Thanksgiving weekend. And so we're going to have uh, only the uh, phone connection. Uh, we'll be in Spokane driving over there. It's about 300 miles. Uh, and so we'll be staying in a uh, motel since there'll be so many of us near where our daughter lives. And uh, so on Saturday, we'll have a virtual church over the um, telephone. So feel free to tune in. We'll have a special program like we do every every week, and uh, uh, but no live uh, programs. I'll also mention that on our, our website. But uh, and our webmaster uh, has been very good at keeping up our current programs, posting them uh, the following week. So if for some reason you do miss a week or you heard a program you liked and you want your um, your friend to uh, take a, a listen to it, uh, well, you can direct them to the site and they can uh, view it themselves. Well, there's been a lot going on in the world uh, the last couple of weeks, uh, as all of you know. Most of it rather um, sad, actually. Uh, what's taking place in the world is foreign policy seems to be disintegrating and our nation and uh, all sort of crises erupting all over the place with a lot of innocents being slaughtered and it just makes you sick to see it. Uh, there's an interesting article by Rich Lowry uh, of the, appeared in the National uh, New York Post. Um, it's titled Paris Doesn't Need Your Hashtag Heroics. Uh, he hits on a point which has irritated uh, me and probably you too. Uh, how people tend to uh, go to silly, trivial little uh, mourning symbols as if that takes care of problems unwilling to face the real problem. You know, we have this uh, uh, peace symbol now with the Eiffel Tower in it. It's, it's like the old peace symbol that they had back in the 50s uh, for nuclear disarmament and then taken over during the Vietnam War as, you know, make uh, make love, uh, not war, make uh, make peace, uh, and so on. They had their peace symbol. And now this putting the Eiffel Tower in the middle of the circle it sort of resembles that uh, peace uh, symbol. And it's called, uh, you know, Peace for, for Paris. And people feel good about that. But it's kind of the sign of the, of the time. Uh, it becomes one of these uh, trendy online mourning symbols where a lot of people are mourning online nowadays. 
where we take these these outrageous, grotesque atroci- atrocities of slaughter and beheading and blowing body parts all over and shooting down innocent people, and we launder them into symbols and slogans that are usually sort of halfway self-congratulatory uh, and wholly ineffectual. Like, we, we post this the symbol now and it's kind of like gee you yeah, know we're really in touch we're touched by this so I post the symbol it's like not even like putting a, a quarter in the uh, the red bucket at Christmas time it's just you know post the symbol uh, totally ineffectual uh, totally you know, worthwhile uh, but this hashtag uh, culture that we've got right now is very much into these superficial symbols uh, of things. It's like this Charlie uh, Hepto bombing earlier uh, there in, in France uh, where they were killing uh, uh, this uh, group that printed the pictures of um, Mohammed. And so people were going around with their little uh, slogans, uh, Je suis Charlie, I am Charlie. Oh, that sounded good. We're standing together. Solidarity. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, an expression of solidarity. Uh, but, you know, what's overlooked, as Lowry points out, is the absurd presumption of it. Really? You're with Charlie? How is that? How is it you're with Charlie? Okay, you're with Charlie. Then draw a sketch of Muhammad and post it online if you're with Charlie. Better yet, do it over and over and over again until you get constant threats and your office is (laughs) firebombed. If you're really with Charlie. Are people really willing to stand up and in the face of uh, these beasts and do what uh, Charlie Hebdo magazine did? Not really. They just say it. Sounds good. I'm with Charlie, okay? How are you with Charlie? Charlie. Well, you're still going to be afraid of the the murderers, right? Even Charlie's not with Charlie anymore. No, they they stopped uh, posting uh, pictures of Muhammad. Why? Well, they didn't want to get bombed anymore. Did it work? Yeah, it worked uh, for the bombers. How about Boko Haram? You know, we had these schoolgirls, 200 of them, kidnapped. Young girls, little girls, 11, 12, 13, so they could be sold to sex slave, raped, and just ter- just terrible. Um, well, you know, that, that problem was uh, largely solved because there was a immediate explosion on Twitter with the hashtag promoted by uh, Michelle o- Obama that said, um, uh, bring back our girls, hashtag bring back our girls. Oh, boy, that just did it, didn't it? And she held up this handwritten sign, Solidarity, bring back our girls. We've done it. These little trite expressions. Was Boko Haram shamed in any way? Well, didn't no sign of it. Didn't lead to anything. I think there were two girls that uh, escaped. They escaped on their own. And some others were rescued, but they were res- rescued by the... Nigerian military uh, because they were armed with weapons and the weapons did what this ineffectual stupid hashtag could not do. But no, we're in a hashtag culture. We just sort of feel good and say nice things and that does it. Well, it, it doesn't do it. Uh, you know, this uh, peaceful peace for Paris uh, with this uh, symbol, you know, uh, it's like the peace symbols of the 1950s and the rest, totally ineffectual with a kind of whiff of blaming the West for this trouble in some ways, hectoring the West because we're causing this evil against us. We've done something wrong, and that's why they're mad against us, uh, these barbarous uh, assaults uh, on us. Well, Paris doesn't need to give peace a chance, uh, friends, really. 
uh, Paris has been very peaceful to these beasts, these savages. It doesn't need to make love, not war. It's been doing that. It doesn't need to be more understanding or more hopeful. It's been doing that. And what's it got? Well, you saw what it, what it got. And there are many cells, and they'll be busy trying to find them out. Uh, maybe for the rest of time, who knows? What Paris needs is to be better protected um, by unsent unsentimental uh, means. You know, that's been what's been neglected in recent uh, years. Um, and that, what does that mean? Well, that means actually confronting evil. But uh, if you're not willing to confront evil, it's, it, it kind of reminds me of this hashtag thing of what Jesus talks about, these Pharisees who like to stand up in the public squares and in the, the gates and in the synagogues and make loud prayers. To what? Well, Jesus nailed it. He said to be seen of men. Oh, the men would think they're pious. Oh, they're concerned. Oh, they love God. You know, they love people and all. You know, all this stuff. But does God hear any of those empty prayers? No, because they don't plan to do anything about anything. They're just up there posturing. And so much of this business going on today is is uh, posturing. And uh, what is it accomplishing? Well, not much, but it's posturing from our president uh, on down. So... As Rich Lowry concludes his article, he says, Forgive me if I'm unmoved by uh, lighting world landmarks up in red, white, and blue or putting a tricolor filter on your Facebook profile. And please don't tell me, in the words of uh, some, that in all this horror there's something positive that people are coming together. Well, what kind of pablum talk is that? sense of unity and peace well that's that's a silly uh, talk the path ahead won't be one of unity and peace it will be of hard thankless work of protecting civilization uh, from its enemies and those who want to destroy it and who are those who want to destroy it well who are the ones bus busily killing uh, people right now and particularly attacking the Jews and attacking Christians and the Christian nation, the biggest Christian nation on face of the earth, of the United States. They said that's that's the most valuable blood. And here we have this uh, fake Indian senator up there in, in uh, Massachusetts and, um, you know, unwilling to admit the bombing of the uh, marathon there in Boston was carried out by what? Muslim refugees, yeah. They don't assimilate. It used to be you come to America, you assimilate. Uh, my parents came from foreign lands to America to assimilate, become Americans. They were Americans first, Norwegians second. Uh, and that, that's how, how they did it. Uh, now that, that's something uh, else. And uh, this Senator Warren, with her... Uh, you know, fake in Indian identity, which she used just to aggrandize herself and get money. Uh, she said, we're not a nation that delivers children back into the hands of ISIS murderers because some politician doesn't like their religion. You know, she's screeching away. Well, see how deceitful all this talk is? Uh, we're not delivering children anywhere. The children aren't here. Where are the children? Well, the children are back in uh, camps, refugee camps in Jordan and Turkey, uh, who are not controlled by ISIS. <laughs> so we're not delivering them anywhere. But, you know, you have these comments like that make sense. Oh, we're just taking these poor children and throwing them to ISIS who wants to kill them. Well, ISIS really is not wanting to kill these people. And most of these refugees are young men a military age, many who were fighters in the Syrian war. And um, ISIS is not out to kill uh, them. 
you know who ISIS is out to kill. ISIS is out to kill the the infidels. These are Muslims, and uh, those that don't like their uh, uh, religion, uh, don't agree with their religion. Those are the ones they want to kill. They stab Jews. They bomb synagogues. Uh, they conduct what amounts to ethnic cleansing of Jews in Europe because they don't like other people's religion. And uh, when Obama wants them to come to the U.S. by the tens of thousands, 90% uh, of all those he's taken so far and plans to take are Muslims. This last year, there was one Yazidi who was being persecuted and a handful of Christians all last year. And yet, who are the ones that can't even survive in these UN refugee camps because they're terrorized by other Muslims in these refugee camps? It's the Christians. Are they the ones that are we're seeking out to bring over here? No, not at all. In fact, if we even suggest it, well, then you're evil. You're discriminating against a, a peaceful uh, religion. Well, th there's truth here. Um, you know, but where does this deceit come from? It seems like everything is upside down, evil, unjust, illogical, self-destructive, unless one considers the, the motives and the ideology behind it. Consider that, maybe have an answer to why we're doing such counterproductive and stupid things. Um, yeah, this, uh, there are evil forces working in the world. There are powers. <laughs> you know, there's an awful lot going on between heaven uh, and earth. Uh, a lot of uh, powers, a lot of action, a lot of activity. And the Bible speaks of it from time to time. And we're generally aware of that, but uh, some of it is just uh, downright evil and satanic and every now and then we have a huge manifestation of it such as when Hitler was burning six million uh, Jews of the tribe of Judah the tribe Jesus came through well I'm going to start in uh, Colossians I won't finish uh, today uh, of course but Colossians the first chapter is um, Sometimes a confusing chapter to some. It need not be, I don't think. And it mentions uh, a mystery in it. Uh, it's a mystery that's referred to in other parts of the New Testament. And generally when these mysteries are referred to, they're mysteries that are in the process of being revealed or have all, always been known but only to a few but are now being unveiled to the world. But they center around one particular important subject. And uh, we'll get into that as we get into Colossians, the uh, first chapter. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, turn with me to Colossians, the first chapter. Um, it's a letter written to this little church in uh, Colossae, uh, which used to be a very big, powerful city wasn't as powerful back in the times of, of Paul. And uh, we know that this letter was probably written 60 uh, A.D. or maybe even earlier, no later. They had a big earthquake in Colossae in 61, 62, pretty well leveled the city. And there's no mention of it in this letter. So apparently it had not uh, taken place. That's why they suggests that this letter that Paul wrote from Rome to uh, Colossae was written uh, prior to that time, and likely so. But we're just going to do a little expository reading uh, here. And a couple things I want to point out as we go through. Uh, and one of them has to do with the relationship of the Father and Jesus. And see how Paul handles it. See what was his mind thinking, how, how he thought, how he viewed the Father and Son as separate entities, separate individuals, separate beings, separate persons. Uh, not the same, not part of a, 
an amalgamated Godhead Trinity sort of a combination. It wasn't even on their horizon. Trinity wasn't even uh, a thought. That's why there's a total absence of it here in the uh, uh, New Testament and why they're always trying to read it back in and translators as they translate the Bible which they have over the years and over the years and are, are trying somehow to kind of work in Trinitarian thought because it's so absent. Um, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, he's not saying he's an apostle as some great authority thing. Apostle simply means one sent. Um, and he sometimes he introduces himself without using the term apostle. So his real authority was his fruit, what he, his message, what he brought. It wasn't that he had some claim that I'm an apostle, you know, and uh, that's like some thing he hung on his wall uh, that that made him a somebody. No, uh, he was a special uh, apostle. He called himself the least of the apostles. He was apostle out of due season. You might say he was one. He was a P.S. postscript. He was added into the apostles for a special function to the Gentiles. And uh, Jesus appeared to him in a, in a vision there along the road to Damascus in Syria. <laughs> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, he often uses the reverse of this. starts with Christ, which means Messiah, Messiah Jesus. Uh, and it almost became like a name. Uh, but that's who Jesus was. He was Messiah. Uh, and Messiah harkens back to the Old Testament belief in the Messiah was always a human Messiah, a human deliverer, a human savior that, that would lead the people. That's how they understood it. And sure enough, he was a human Messiah, and he led the people. But then he died. And uh, now he is living again uh, in heaven with his heavenly father. So he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. That is, he was appointed. Did Jesus appoint the 12? Yeah, he appointed 12. Did he appoint Paul out of season? Well, yes, you read about it in the book of Acts. Uh, so that's where his appointment came, his selection to be one of the chosen messengers uh, of the gospel and what was the gospel well that was the good news that's what gospel means of the kingdom of god the essential message jesus had brought and this is uh, what paul was bringing as well uh, by the will of god so he understood that this was god's will god willed it you know he he, he knew that nobody comes to the son except the father draw him it has to be the father's will uh, this is the church of god it's god's church and jesus has been appointed as a head of the church but it's god's church it all operates by the will of god so his appointment by christ was also part of the will of god that's where the ultimate authority is is it not And Timothy, our brother. So he does it in the Hebrew style, which is different from the uh, uh, Hellenistic Greek style letters in the day. He starts by identifying the sender and the uh, the the sendee, the who, uh, the the object, the direction of the letter uh, to the saints and brothers in Christ in Colossae. So it's I, Paul, and Timothy to you, uh, brethren, there in. Colossi. That's a st standard introduction. Timothy, our brother. He's, he's not subordinating Timothy like Timothy's not an apostle, so he's lower rank. No, he regards him as an equal, as, as his brother, as he does in other references to uh, Timothy. Verse 2, To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ in Col uh, Colossae, uh, brothers, brethren, male and female, of course, 
um, and they're holy. <laughs> Are you holy? Does God regard you holy? Well, he, he really does. We'll, we'll ponder that a little bit more uh, in this uh, chapter. To the holy and faithful brothers in Christ... That is, they are now having the spiritual union with Christ. How do you have that? How do you have Christ in you or the Messiah in you? Well, it's because you've decided to follow him, to become like him, to internalize uh, his goal, his character, his way of life. Now, that's how you spiritually unite with Christ. That's how you are in Christ. It is just a name you hang. Uh, it's a transformation that takes place in your will, in your mind, that you're now in Christ. Uh, and how is Jesus uh, in God? Well, uh, he said he did all things to please his Father, uh, including the words he spoke. Everything else was directed uh, to please his Father, and came from his father's will so if you're in christ well what do you do well the very exact same thing as jesus did because he is now your leader your messiah uh, the one who is leading you to the father does he know the way he's already there he's already at the father's side he's already passed the great gulf between death and life life eternal glorification with a new body he's still a man but he's glorified now and lives forever he's at the side of the father so he is now your messiah you're in him you're following his path to where he is and that of course is in the, the father's eternal kingdom in the father's bosom as it were and that kingdom is coming to earth and then he gives us uh, his peace greeting, which is a little shorter here than some of the other epistles, but it's meaningful. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. So who is the one who gives authority to offer blessings? Well, uh, read about it there, the great blessing of uh, of numbers, the number six, the uh, the ironic blessing it comes from from God that you would have peace happiness uh, and that comes from God so he is offering now grace which means forgiveness and pardon and comfort and blessing from, from God and peace so he is offering that as now a blessing upon his people these just are not salt and pepper kind of perfunctory uh, words these are just not imprints that he stamps on things you know like it's uh, some sort of boilerplate but these are meaningful expressions of actualities of actual peace of actual grace from God do you want grace from God peace from God of course I do So a beautiful greeting identifies who he is, uh, who he's sending it to, and then gives his blessing. And now he begins with a note of thanksgiving, which is uh, certainly fitting. And uh, it's kind of a theme here in Colossians anyway, this thanksgiving. You know, God likes a thankful heart. It's one of the cherished things of God is that we have a heart of thank thankfulness which means you are actually looking around and appreciating the things you have rather than complaining about the things you don't and what are the most precious things you've been given your car your house uh, your bank account what is it We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice how he handles relationships here. We always thank God. Who is God? He's the Father. 
He's the father of you and me, but he's now the father of our Lord. Doesn't say God. No, Lord, Master. Jesus Christ. So that's the clear relationship. And so when we follow Christ, we're brother with Christ, as it says here, brothers in Christ. We're, we're in that sense, equal with Christ He's the firstborn, so he's always always has supremacy and leadership. Uh, but we are one with him, part of his brothers. Like Jesus said to his disciples, I, I, I don't look upon you as, as subordinate servants or something, but as friends, as brothers, as, as equals before God, that we can become one with God as I am one with God. This is how Jesus uh, prayed. So we always thank God. Now, is he just blowing steam here? Or does he actually pray this way? Do you think he's honest? Well, I do. I, he always thanks God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, when we pray for you. So when he prays for them, he thanks God for them. Because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah, he th he's thankful to God for the good work that's being done. Uh, and we should have that kind of attitude about our friends, people we know, fellow Christians, rather than I to criticize what they may lack or think that maybe they're not up to snuff on some doctrinal thing that's, that's your hobby horse or they're not part of the group you think is the one true church or some other kind of silly notion but thank God for what is good we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints so what he was looking to is, is their character and their faith and their love means how they treat other people the softening of their heart they've been washed by God they've become new people with new priorities the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven you notice these three things faith hope and love all together here in one sentence uh, you know what are they well these are the three great Christian virtues. Read about them there in the book of uh, Corinthians. Faith, hope, and love. Uh, faith, which means belief. Uh, belief with action. And love is an expression of obedience to God first, to man second. You love God with all your heart and you love your neighbor as yourself. These have actions attached to them that spring from the hope. And the hope, of course, is in the kingdom of God and the resurrection because, you know, that is our eternal future. We're all one in that. Uh, we all belong to God. He's going to weigh all things that is stored up for you in heaven. So the seed of our salvation comes from God who is in heaven. And that you've already heard about, that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel. Yes, the gospel of the kingdom of God that has come to you. You've already heard that. He's reminding them now of the essentials of their faith, laying a good groundwork for what he's going to get into. They had some heresies being batted about there in Colossae. He's going to deal with them. Uh, some later on in this um, in this book. Well, I'm going to stop right there with um, our foot in the book of uh, Colossians. It's a short uh, book. What does it have? Four chapters to it, uh, I think. Not, that's about it. I think four chapters, or is it five? It's short anyway. And um, yeah, just four chapters. Uh, we're not going to go through the whole book. We're just going to go to chapter 1. So, And we want to focus beginning in uh, the verses 
having to do with the mystery that's being revealed and what that mystery might be and how it makes so much total sense and ties everything from Genesis to Revelation uh, together. So we'll get into that more time. Uh, and um, I think you'll find it terribly encouraging as, as I have. So read ahead in the book of Colossians so that you'll be um, more in tune uh, as we cover. We'll probably finish it next week when we're in Spokane and we'll do it on the uh, phone hookup of the virtual church. Well, that uh, should conclude our time here uh, today. And um, I'm going to uh, close with a uh, tune here um, after uh, prayer. So join me as we ask God's dismissal. Our Father which art in heaven, we do ask your blessing upon us of peace and of grace. You've forgiven us of our sins. You look upon us as your holy people, perfect, without blemish, because of what you've done with us. Father, help us to live up to the example of your Son and become like him in, in every sense. And so become pleasing to you as he was in every sense. We ask your help as we deal with the troubles of this world and this world that seems to be awash and drowning in the darkness of hopelessness, that there is great hope. The sun yet shines. The kingdom of God dawns. Help us, Father, to reach out toward that kingdom and hope and meanwhile live our lives in faith and live our lives in love one toward another and toward you. We ask your dismissal now and your blessing on us all. In Jesus' name, amen. And we look forward to uh, seeing you all next week. Maybe not seeing you, but at least uh, sharing the Sabbath uh, together with you.